Um, we have kids in the service today, so that makes this a superhero Sunday. Okay, kids, who's this? The Avengers. Good guys or bad guys? I'm hearing a lot of rumbling here. I'm not getting strong answers. Good guys. Are they friends or enemies? Oh, that's a hard question. They're friends, but it looks like they're fighting, doesn't it? Do you guys remember what happened in this movie? Right? The government wanted the Avengers to agree to certain rules, and half the Avengers thought it was a good idea, and the other half didn't. And each side believed that they were right, and the other side was wrong. And each side was determined that they were going to get their own way. Now, the question is, are the Avengers better off split up or working together? Working together. But the problem is, by the end of the movie, they're still split up. And they're still split up because of a combination of pride, right? There are people who said, I'm right, and I want you to know it. And it was pride combined with fear. People who said, what happens if I don't get my way? And each side thinks that it's worth to stand their ground, even to the point of being divided. And if you know what's coming, you know that's going to be a big problem when the new bully shows up on the block. The Avengers, united, are a lot more powerful than the, Avenger, than the Avengers divided. And that's not a bad way to think about this year's theme. Church, we are far more powerful united than we are divided. And the bully that shows up on our block is far bigger than anything that the Avengers will face. And yet pride, the look at me instinct in us, and fear, the who's going to take care of my need instinct in us, tends to divide us all the time. We can be far more concerned about who gets the credit than what is right. We can be far more concerned about what is comfortable and familiar than what is appropriate. Bottom line is we can care a lot more about me than we care about us. So how do we turn that around? How do we move away from look at me pride and who's going to take care of my needs fear and move towards unity? Jesus' final teaching to his disciples before the cross addressed this head on. We are starting this morning a series that looks at John chapter 13 through 17. It's Jesus in the upper room. And these chapters are very much about how we relate to one another. In these chapters, we see them celebrating a Passover meal together. And then immediately after that meal, Jesus is going to be betrayed, arrested, crucified, and then resurrected. Today's passage is the start of that final teaching time in the upper room. And Jesus starts that teaching time with an object lesson. And there are three things that I want us to pay attention to about that object lesson. I want us to pay attention to what Jesus actually does. I want us to pay attention to the broader significance that he points us to. And then I want us to pay attention to the pattern that he gives us to follow. And let's start by focusing on verses 1 through 5 and what Jesus actually does. And what he does is he accepts a lesser role. Now, if you grew up in church, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet is probably pretty familiar to you. But even if it is, we can miss the fact that the passage doesn't actually start with the foot washing. The passage starts with the description of Jesus. Jesus knew that the cross was right around the corner. And then Jesus does something. And what it says that he does is he loved the disciples to the end. The literal idea behind that word that's translated to the end would be something like to the full or even to eternity. 
It's the idea that you can't get bigger than this. You can't get more than this. It's like to infinity and beyond. He's about to show them that his love is beyond comprehension. He will love them with a love that not even eternity can contain. Every picture that you and I have of love is limited. Kids, I know you do not believe this, but let me tell you that it's true. Your parents want to love you perfectly. But here's the problem. Your parents are limited. Your parents don't know everything. Well, you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> Your parents don't have all the time in the world. There are going to be times that they just don't have the resources to give you everything that they would want to give you. And even if they could, even if they weren't limited by imperfection and lack of resources and time, that someday your parents are not going to be with you. Jesus' love for you is not limited by anything. Anything. The disciples will get a glimpse of that in just a few verses, but where they're going to see it most powerfully is on the cross and in the resurrection. Verse 3 in the original language, it's really clear that the focus here is on Jesus' motivation. Jesus is going to do what he's about to do because there are three things that he knows. The first thing that he knows is that he has authority over everything. He has come from the Father. That's the second thing he knows. He knows his source, and he is going to the Father. He knows his future. That's the third thing he knows. In other words, Jesus knew exactly who he was and exactly what he was doing. Sometimes we take on a task. Sometimes we step into a role, and it's out of ignorance. Right? We say, sure, I'll help you move. I didn't know you owned a piano. Jesus knew everything about the situation. And with that knowledge, Jesus performed the lowest task given to the lowest servant in that culture. Now, we can guess that this is bad, but honestly, we don't get the full grasp of it because we are not in their culture. Think about what it would be like in their time period. In their streets, their streets were mainly made out of mud, dirt, and I'm serious about this, sewage. That's what they were walking through. Now, you enter someone's home for a meal, the lowest servant in that house would wash the guest's feet because otherwise, frankly, it would be disgusting. In a Jewish home, even the lowest Jewish servant wouldn't be allowed to perform this task. It was considered too far beneath them. Some of you might remember the TV show Dirty Jobs. There is not one single job that has ever been on that show that would be looked down upon as much as the job of washing someone's feet. How demeaning was it? The disciples didn't even wash their own feet. Right? John walks through the door, says, there's no one here to wash my feet. Well, I'm not going to wash my own feet. That's disgusting. Peter walks through the door. No one here to wash my feet. Well, I'm not going to wash my own feet. That's disgusting. That's beneath me. James walks through the door. There's no one here to wash my feet. Well, I'm not going to wash my own feet. That's way beneath me. They wouldn't even take care of themselves. This was so demeaning. They would rather eat with the smell and feel of filth than to even clean themselves. Jesus intentionally adopted a role that the culture said was radically beneath him. And the culture just understood him as a good teacher. Had they understood who he really was, that he was God in flesh, 
it would be absolutely beyond what they could imagine. Jesus understood his relationship to the Father. He had all authority because of the Father. His source and his future were in the Father. There was nothing about him that was not covered by the Father. There was nothing that lowering himself to such a low position could take from him. There was nothing that this act of service would do to change the reality of who Jesus is. I like a good movie about castles and kings and queens and especially if you throw in a dragon and a few zombies and it's, you know, you've got the making of a great movie. Um, Ann and I recently saw one of the single worst movies that we have ever seen in our lives. I will not tell you if we saw it in the theaters, on Netflix, on Amazon, on TV, or some other source because I don't want to give it that level of advertising. Now, we were hopeful, I was hopeful, because almost everything in this movie takes place in a castle. And it's all about a king and a queen and, and <clears throat> all of the different people who are around this king and the queen. And every act of service to the king and queen, and this is what made the movie so bad, was thinly disguised acts of selfishness. You didn't like anyone in this movie. Every relationship in the movie was a selfish attempt to get or to keep something from someone else. You even had spouses and relatives that were willing to kill each other off if it helped them gain or keep their position. For everything that was bad about this movie, it did drive home one point. If you believe that the ultimate source of meeting your need for love or security is in someone else, then every act of service towards that person has the risk of being an attempt to use them. That's what you saw in this movie. Every act of service done with a smile was really an attempt to manipulate, to control, to gain favor. Jesus knew that he was covered by the Father in every way, his past, his present, his future, his identity. And that motivated him to radically and humbly serve. We are not Jesus. Our relationship with the Father is different. But every principle that we just stated works for us as well. Everything that we have, everything that we are, everything that we will be is because of the love of God for us. I do not have to be selfish with him. I do not have to manipulate him. I can't. If I think that the Father is in charge of my needs and will provide through the means that he sees fit and will provide because he loves me, then I am free to radically, humbly love and serve others. I'm not depending on them to make me feel important or secure. When Jesus come to wash Peter's feet, Peter resists. In Jesus' response, we learn that the sacrifice of washing the disciples' feet is really a picture of a much bigger sacrifice. Okay, anyone know who this is? Snow White, yes. Now, it was Rebecca Simcox, by the way, who at one point snagged me and said, you know, you can throw in a princess every now and then. I wasn't sure what to do with that, but I'm doing my best. How would you feel if you got home today and you found Snow White cleaning your floors? <laughs> Well, okay, I'm speaking realistically here. <laughs> Let's start with the fact that it would just be weird. I mean, getting beyond the fact that there's a cartoon in your kitchen. Right, once you got beyond that, you would look at that and say, wait a minute, you're Snow White, you're famous, you're a princess. There's nothing wrong with cleaning floors, but what's making this awkward is the person that's doing it. 
we would immediately want to say to Snow White, sit down, can I serve you something? Can I get you something to drink? Can I get you an apple? <laughs> we would serve her. That's really what's behind Peter's question in verse 6. Someone of Jesus' stature performing this task is incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable. It is totally out of place. And Peter raises that concern, but here's what's fascinating. Jesus doesn't really explain it. His answer is, it's going to make sense in the end. When Jesus what Jesus is doing is going to make sense after the cross, after the resurrection, after the ascension, after the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then they're going to look back and it's going to make sense. The conversation that picks up in verse 8 can be incredibly confusing. And here's why. You ever been in a conversation with a friend where it's the same conversation, but you're talking about two different topics and you don't know it? It happens to me. It usually happens to Ann and me when we change topics without signaling. Um, like, it might go something like this. I might ask, how's your dinner? Mine's really good. And Ann might say, it's the worst ever. And I'll say, do you need me to say something to the waiter? Do you need me to say something to someone? And Ann says, it's not going to do any good. Who's going to listen to you? I said, well, we come to this restaurant all the time. They like us. And then Anne looks at me and says, what are you talking about? I was talking about that horrible movie we saw the other night. <laughs> See, that's actually what's going on in verse 8. Peter is still talking about foot washing, but Jesus is trying to raise the conversation. He's pointing to something different. He's talking about being clean morally, clean before God. Jesus is pointing ahead to the cross. This is how, what will make sense in the end. That's really the only way to make sense, or it's the best way, I think, to make sense of Jesus saying something like, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have nothing to do with me. He's not saying, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, get out. It's a bigger picture here. If Peter isn't made right before God through Jesus, then Peter won't be able to have anything to do with Christ. I think that's amplified in verses 9 and 10. Peter is still talking about foot washing, but Jesus is driving home the point about being clean before God. The person who is not clean in these verses is Judas. But the only way that he is less clean than anyone else in that room is the fact that he is about to betray Jesus. Physically, Judas is just as dirty as everyone else in the room. But spiritually, he was not. Spiritually, he was not as clean. The ultimate act of humble love, the ultimate example of taking a lesser role was not Jesus washing feet. It was Jesus on the cross. That is what is going to make sense to them in the end. Radical humility was the creator coming into creation. Radical humility was sinless, perfect Jesus taking on all of the guilt for all of the sins of humanity. Jesus went to the cross for the same reasons that he washed the disciples' feet. He knew exactly who he was. He was the perfect creator and sustainer of the universe. He was the one by whom and for whom all things were made. And that meant he was the only one who could provide a sacrifice that would meet the demands of perfection. He was the only one who could take on our guilt and sin and have the perfect God say, that's good enough. And Jesus looked at all the ugliness and all the filth of all of our sin. And he loved us to the end. Washing their feet was about getting the disciples ready. But it was not about getting them ready to eat. It was about getting them ready for the significance of the cross. It was about getting them ready to continue when Jesus was gone. And this is especially evident when we look at the last paragraph. And that's where we see the master's pattern. 
Okay, what is this? Christmas tree. Now, I mean, does that look exactly like the Christmas tree you had? So how do you know that's a Christmas tree? How do you know that's not just a tree in the forest? It has presents. It has lights. It has ornaments, decorations. It follows a certain pattern. When Jesus said in verse 15 that he had given the disciples an example, the word that he used that's translated example means he had given them a pattern to follow. He's not saying that they have to do exactly what he did, exactly the way they did it. Although he does tell them to wash one another's feet, and I think that's probably would be a good practice for them. But if that's all they did, they've missed the point. Because the point is that Jesus is showing them the pattern for what it looks like to humbly love and serve one another. Let me point out three things that seem to make up the pattern that Jesus is showing the disciples. The first part of the pattern, something that makes a lower position a lower position, is that it's not your responsibility. Right? There are things that we step into and do all the time because we feel responsible for it. It's not my house, but I'm the one who spilled the milk, so I'll clean it up. It wasn't Jesus' responsibility to wash their feet. Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. You see, when people from this church go with David Fisher on a trip to Eight Days of Hope, they are stepping in to help people affected by tragedy, and they are people that we don't know, we may never see again. We have no external responsibility to take care of those needs. We didn't create the problem. We don't have dependents involved. There is no reason to do it other than to care for the people who, we, who will be blessed. That's what it's like to take on something that is not our responsibility. I think the second part of the pattern is that it's humbling. And what I mean by that is it's really about elevating someone else's glory. There's no way that the motive behind washing feet or getting on the cross was it, was it so people would say, look at Jesus, what a great guy. In washing feet, Jesus was treating others as important, not himself. Humbling yourself isn't necessarily about doing a dirty job. It's about exalting others. I used to work with someone in Dallas years ago who was amazing about helping his coworkers, his peers behind the scenes, even when he knew that the peers would get all the credit from the CEO and he would get none. It's not that he didn't want to succeed. He did. It's just that he didn't mind if others succeeded and got the spotlight. He willingly elevated others at the expense of his own time and his own recognition. That's what it looks like to elevate the spotlight of someone else. And third, it meets a need. The feet needed to be washed. Without Jesus going to the cross, we would have no hope. Jesus' example is not an example of passively watching the needs go by. He's not settling for, I just won't get in the way. It's Jesus seeing a need and alleviating it at personal cost. We don't have a large maintenance staff at this church. We have one full-time person. And we have some part-time people that work very hard, but they're just very limited in their time. See, when someone gets to the end of an event and sees that the room needs to be vacuumed and vacuums it, sees that chairs need to be put away and puts them away, see that tables need to be set up and sets them up, that's huge. It's not fun. It's not even necessarily your job. But it meets a huge, huge need. See, it's almost impossible for us to understand the radical humility that Jesus displayed when he knelt down and washed the disciples' feet. 
we really don't have anything like it in our culture whatsoever. But I still think we can understand the pattern that we're supposed to follow. We need to actively seek to meet one another's needs. We need to meet that need, even if it's not in our job description. It's not our responsibility. And we need to meet that need, even if it takes the spotlight off of us and puts it on someone else. How do we build healthy relationships with one another? How do we overcome the incredible power that operates within us of pride and fear? I think we need to start by examining what we want. If what we want is power and influence and self-protection and pride to be lifted up, then pride and fear are going to continue to rule our relationships. Jesus shows us that there's something different to desire. And that's really the point of this message. Desire. Aspire to a lower position. The Avengers allowed pride and fear to divide them. When a serious threat showed up, they couldn't handle it. Jesus never intended for his people to face the threats of Satan and of living in a broken world as a divided people. We need to be unified with one another, but it will only happen if we aspire to lower positions. Jesus' final statement in the passage was, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I think he wants to send a message. I think he wants us to radically and humbly serve one another. So let's take some steps towards that this week. I've suggested four steps. These are on the tear-off part of your bulletin and uh, would encourage you to tear that off, fill out how you want to respond to the message, whether, whether it's this or something else. And we have boxes in the foyer where you can drop those off. And then we as a staff will pray for you. But again, four suggestions. One is to share with one another. Part of being unified is actually not being alone. So share with one another the discussion questions. Talk about the message. Talk about what God is doing in your life together. Study. Go back through this passage and look what it says about how to relate to one another. Pray. Ask the Lord daily that he would help you trust him to meet your needs. And then daily practice. Put someone else's needs first. Be proactive when you see a need, even if it costs you time, resources, even if it elevates the spotlight of someone else. Take the time and meet the need. Aspire to a lower position. Seek to meet needs, even if it's not in your job description, even if it lift up, lifts up someone else. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. These folks are here to pray with you. They're here to pray with you about anything that you are facing. Why would you need to pray after a message like this? Because you may look at this message and you may say, Pride and fear are hardwired into me, and I need help overcoming them. And we are here to pray with you. But there may be something else going on. If you're struggling financially, struggling with relationships, or if you want to know the Savior who loves you so much that he went to the cross for you, then we would like to introduce him to you. Would you stand and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you reminded of the extraordinary love that you have given us. We, remind, we are reminded that you pursued us at incredible cost, the cost of your own son when we were your enemies. We are reminded that that pursuit was extraordinarily sacrificial. 
Lord, you have asked us to be reflections of your character in this society. Help us to do that by loving one another and loving others humbly, sacrificially. But we need your help with that, and we ask for it today. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here's your thought as you leave. Who is Jesus? What is he like? Jesus radically, sacrificially humbled himself to love. So our charge as we leave here is to aspire to follow his example, to aspire to a lower position. You are dismissed.